Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us for the Open Education Resources and Affordable Learning Materials webinar. Our three presenters today are going to give us a few different perspectives. Uh, Aline Souls is a library faculty member at California State University East Bay, and she is going to be speaking about um, one of the longest running open education resources uh, programs that I know of. And then next after Aline is going to be Annie Knight from Santa Ana College with the Community College Perspective. And then we've got Dana Ospina from Cal Poly Slow. And so I'm going to go ahead and just get started and hand things over to them. And Aline, it's over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Carmen. Um, I'm apparently controlling your screen now, so I'll just see if I can move ahead here. Um, I'm not quite sure how to move forward here. If you go down to the bottom right, use your cursor to the bottom right and use the arrow, bu arrow buttons. Cursor to the bottom right. And I'm sorry, bottom, bottom left. Bottom left. Well, it's not moving, so. Ah, there we are. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I have been um, doing this. Apparently, I can't stop it now. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. Uh, I can't. I, okay. Um, anyway, so there I am with my name. There's my email address, and there's the link on the front page to, um, I can't get it to stop moving around on its own, which what, is. What if I go ahead and do it and you can tell me when you want me to move it forward. How about that? I'd be happy to turn it back over to okay. you. Okay, um, I got it. You got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, there is my email address and also the link to our affordable learning solutions uh, live guide page, uh, which we hope to be improving somewhere during the course of this year. Next slide, please. Um, serendipity has been a very important uh, element to our program here. <clears throat> I've often come to think that it's important to everything. Um, we got <clears throat> a graduation initiative grant in 2010, 2011, that academic year. It had nothing to do with affordable learning solutions, which you know Jerry Hanley hadn't even mentioned yet. We got $20,000, and the idea was that to alleviate students' financial burden for textbooks. But this was a proposal that had come out of the fact that the Chancellor's Office offered our uh, Vice President for uh, Academic Programs and Grad Studies the opportunity to offer something like 10 or 12 grants. And <clears throat> we, d I, we just applied for one. And I just you know, suggested, well, we could try this. And before I knew where I was, I had inherited it. So be careful what you uh, suggest to your deans. Um, we bought print textbooks for course reserves, spent 13,000 on that, and we provided financial incentive for seven faculty to create their own open source ADA compliant textbooks, and we had spent 7,000 on that. But right at the same time, student fees were being consolidated. In fact, we had to go through the uh, Board of Trustees down in, in Long Beach in order to get that to happen. And they created this A2E2 committee, Academic Access Enhancement Excellence. And so what happened is that that portion, the A2A2 E2 committee, which has got plenty of student representation on it since it's student fees, they're the ones who provided the money for the textbooks on reserve since then. And I have focused on other things. And those other things have continued to be under the aegis of the library. Next slide, please. So where we spent our money, obviously we spent it on reserve textbooks. We've always had faculty copies. A lot of faculty are very concerned about student, um, student costs. And if they have a copy, they will provide one. And then there are these A2E2 funds for which we've applied successfully. And then there have been these faculty incentives to convert courses to less expensive options. And all of these have been funded by the CO grant of 2014-15, which I got. And then it was much more open. You could create your own. It wasn't like the AB 798 one, which requires you to use existing things. But we did get that AB 798 grant, although I haven't seen the money yet. So if anybody else has seen the money, please let me know. I keep asking. And they tell me they're going to send me a check now. So we'll see. Anyway, next slide, please. So <clears throat> I have been in academia a long time and uh, over 40 years now. 
And I've been in four different institutions in two different countries, uh, one private and, and three public, and it's just a good mix. And I've learned a long time ago that you get nothing for your students if you don't have your faculty on board, and if you don't have a pipeline to your faculty. So I spent two and a half years getting an approval for an affordable learning solutions subcommittee of our Senate. It actually reports to our committee on instruction and curriculum. So it's a subcommittee of a committee of the Senate. But the point is, I have that pipeline. And the voting members are the faculty from each college, which includes the library, and associated students. And then we have a bunch of ex officio people for duplicating services, IT, accessibility, so on and so forth. And somebody always is there from uh, the Committee on Instruction Curriculum to which we report officially. But the point of it is, we are embedded in the Senate. And even though it's tough going all the time, the reality is I have that pipeline. And the person who comes after me will also have that pipeline. Because once you set this in motion and once you get that infrastructure, you've got it. We also set up a live guide, which I mentioned earlier. And I do have a resource ideas tab on it. And there is a finding OER document that anybody can go and take. And um, our faculty will go and take it. It, it started with Leslie Kennedy's um, list of where you could go. And we've been building on it since then. Because if a faculty member tells me, I found something useful through this particular site, I will simply add it to the document and upload a, uh, a, more, um, a more current version of the document. So I'm the coordinator. I have a backup librarian and a second, second backup in our online campus because um, our online campus unit hired a woman named Monica Munoz, who was the ALS coordinator at San Francisco State. So she knows, you know, she knows how, how it goes. So um, we have backup now, which is really helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So savings. According to the Chancellor's Office, we've saved 177890 dollars through 2016. I have no idea where that figure comes from, to be perfectly honest, because I was so busy scrambling around trying to make this happen that I didn't really pay enough attention up to what I was saving. And since we started when nobody else was doing it, I just didn't, I just didn't even think about it. Um, anything I do with this particular initiative, and I never call it a program because it's going to go on forever, um, or at least long enough that we'll forget when it started. And I, I basically do it all in my own time. There's, there's, no, there's no question about it. I have a full-time job here, and then I have this on top of it. So there you go. So um, the workflow for faculty to participate, I was asked about workflow for faculty to participate. And I'm working on as much incentive as I can provide and the least amount of administration that they have to do. So. Um, for the CO grant that I had before the AB 798 one, I just had a one-page form that I asked for their contact information, brief description of, their, description of their plan, and how they keep the materials current. For the AB 798, it's a combination of things, but I, I do have to go back to them periodically and ask, you know, how's it going and what's it going? And I'll certainly spend a lot of time helping them find things, but I try to keep the bureaucracy to a minimum because personally I can't stand it and they don't have time for it. So that's the goal. But I am spending more time tracking costs. You will be happy to hear. Next uh, slide, please. So starting a program, what do you need to know? Whatever happens, and there will be, it, it's a long, hard slog, but anything you achieve is more than you had before. And you, the key is not to overreach. You have to make it doable for yourself because you aren't necessarily going to have a lot of help all the time if you have help wonderful take advantage of it if you don't have help it's got to be manageable and the other thing is go for low-hanging fruit cooperative willing faculty are out there forget the rest for now i mean i've got plenty of faculty who just snort and poo poo the whole thing and my whole thing is fine go ahead i've got plenty of work with these other guys and what i want is for those other guys to convince the faculty members. I don't have to go out and sell it. I'm finally getting to a tipping point after five years of this, where, or almost six now, where some faculty are taking it to their departments and whole departments are starting to look at it. So I don't have to sell. All I had to do was sell to the, to the front runners and then get them to help me. So 
you know, go for them. Uh, it makes life easier. Involve the Senate if you can, because only through faculty are you going to achieve benefit for students. And then you have to prepare for the big three faculty concerns. I don't have time, and I have deep sympathy with that. I really do, because anything we ask them to do, put, it, put your course online, use affordable learning solutions, do this, do that. Everyone takes more time than just pushing a button and saying, renew my book for next quarter. Um, copyright, some faculty still feel nervous about copyright. And you have to keep explaining to them that open, when it says open educational resources, does not mean free. It means it's copyright available to you. So the other concern they have with some justification, I think also, is quality of open educational resources. So you have to spend some time reassuring them about that. And, and I keep telling them, if you're happy with the things we find, they have the quality you want. If you're not happy, then it's not. It's a little like hunting for uh, library resources. You're looking for something that's relevant and that fits your need and that you trust. So we work on that too. Next, next slide, please. So if you have print copies of textbooks, put them on reserve. Even earlier editions will often work. If you have electronic copies, find a way to advertise them because we have them at least in our place through the catalog, so we have to promote them. Um, help faculty find alternative learning solutions. You know, and, and again, I mentioned the resource ideas tab that was originally Leslie's. And work with your faculty development office on workshops to start discussions because they have the list of contacts and you can make each other look good. We're about to do a program in mid-January. It's all being done through faculty development. They're, they booked me a room. Um, they helped order, uh, they're about to help me order um, uh, refreshments for the event. They have the connections, they have the advertising, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay for it out of the grant. So they get the money and I get the help. So that's, that's how we're working it here at any rate. Next slide, please. So there we are. Now, before I uh, pass it on to the next person, um, we did get some questions in advance, and I want to make sure that I address them. How do you ensure OER materials are ADA accessible? ADA accessible, or do you? Well, one of our ALS subcommittee members is from Accessibility Services, so they're fully embedded into our process. But we don't police materials for accessibility. We do remind faculty of the importance of this element, and many faculty avail themselves of accessibility services, but it's up to the faculty member to address this issue, regardless of whether the materials are OER or any other type of material. And certainly if they come to me and they want help, they will, but they know where the accessibility services office is, and they usually go directly to them, and that solves, well, I don't know if it solves the problem. And certainly there may be more OER materials that are either not compliant or less compliant. But faculty are pretty attuned to it here. Then we have a question about how do you maintain the records of who's participated in the program? Well, uh, at this point I know, and the question has prompted me to think that I should make a formal list, so thank you to whoever asked that. The next question is, are they available to the public? Well, not really uh, at this point, but I would certainly put, um, I, when I make this list, I am going to put it on our live guide in a separate tab. So I guess they'll be available to the public if the public chooses to find them. How do students access ALS and OER materials? Well, if they're eBooks that you know we're making available or something like that, it's usually in the catalog. But usually, what happens is that there are links in a faculty member's syllabus, and that's how that's the easiest way. We have Blackboard here as our learning management system, and they often embed them in, in, in the learning management system as well. So that's usually uh, how we do it. Um, I will say, however, though, when it comes to who's participating in the program, yes, I can provide that list. But I've, I, the reason I haven't done it to date is because there are a lot of faculty out there who somehow don't hear about you know, the grants and the opportunities to get money and incentives and everything else, and have been going ahead and doing this all on their own because of, they, they feel it's the right thing to do. And I don't necessarily know who they are. They don't, I, I don't believe I know everybody who's using open educational resources at this point. I know who's applied for grant funds or who's on the grant listing but I don't know everybody who's doing it. 
And I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to find out. I have sent out feelers periodically, but I don't get much response. Um, then we have um, a question about OER text for library technician certificate programs, which I simply can't answer. Um, examples of faculty incentives and other support. And where does one find funding? Well, faculty incentives come in the form of stipends or honorary of some sort, but it's not enough to buy out their time, which is, of course, the big concern. So I've always told faculty, if they sign on to try OER options, they should do it because they want to help students and consider any other benefit, primarily monetary, as a bonus. Because there's not enough money for me to buy out their time, which is just the big key. Um, disciplines and faculty that might be more interested in OER. Um, I would look at the Cool for Ed and OpenStax sites. A glance at the 50 books on Cool for Ed and the offerings by OpenStax will give you a sense of what's available and, and what's of quality and what disciplines have more, uh, more resources available to them than others. For example, if you go in and you want a, a basic business course, on management or marketing, you'll probably find plenty of OER materials. If you want, for example, to provide OER materials for a class that I had to provide materials for last summer, which was um, human anatomy for social workers. Uh, good luck with that one. Um, we could find anatomy things, but it was hard to find them specifically for social workers. Um, so there's a mix and faculty have their own ideas about what is and is not um, good all you can do is sit with them and work with them and try to help them tips to get started and in getting institution buy-in every campus has its own culture and you'll have to assess it but again i'd focus on faculty if faculty are on board students will follow and administration will pay attention um anyway um so uh, when it comes to someone who said we're looking for a pathway to begin incorporating OER as well, to me, first it's faculty, second it's students, because to help students you have to go through faculty. So I hope I've addressed the questions that came in in advance. And what I'm going to suggest now after 20 minutes of listening to me is that uh, Carmen pass it off to our next speaker and we can um, talk about any questions you may have at the end. Sounds good. Thanks, Aline. All right, Annie, are you ready for me to give you control? Yes, thank you. Okay, it's over to you now. If you have any problems, I can advance the slides for you, but let's give this a shot. Okay, thanks. Um, so hi everybody, I'm Annie Knight, an instruction and reference librarian at Santa Ana College. I was hired on at SAC in the fall of 2014, and among my various responsibilities, I serve as our campus's OER librarian liaison, though I'm often referred to more simply as the OER librarian. And OER is just one of several liaison areas I serve, and I also teach information literacy and library tech um, courses here on our campus. Um, I couldn't agree more with Eileen's recommendations for what you need to know about starting an OER program. I thought all of her recommendations were great, and I found that to be true on our campus as well, for what it's worth. So, switch to my next slide here. Oh, these look a little different. Okay. So um, just a little bit about Santa Ana College. Uh, it is a community college, of course, located in Southern California within Orange County. The college was initially named Santa Ana Junior College and was founded in 1915 as a small department of Santa Ana High School. As you can probably guess by our founding date, we celebrated our centennial last year. Um, I've also included our most recent credit headcount along with a link to student demographic data, assuming these slides will be shared out, in case you'd like to see a breakdown of our diverse student population in terms of ethnicity, age, gender, and um, educational goals. So Santa Ana College has been involved with utilizing OER in an official, uh, more official capacity since 2011, beginning with our participation in the Kaleidoscope Project, which is also referred to as the Kaleidoscope Open Course Initiative, co-sponsored by Educause and the Gates Foundation. 
The work for this grant included creating and adopting course designs using OER for some of our uh, high enrollment courses. <clears throat> SAC has since continued to develop its utilization of OER in a variety of capacities by targeting additional courses and identifying faculty across the disciplines who have experience using OER. Um, additionally, professional development opportunities have been developed to support interested faculty. Uh, from an organizational standpoint, our campus OER initiatives are coordinated by Shirley Kushida, who also serves as the college's coordinator of distance education. So she has quite a lot on her plate. This past summer, uh, SAC was awarded a $100,000 grant through the Achieving the Dream Open Educational Resources Degree Initiative. The main goal of this grant is to improve college success or access and completion for underserved students by way of OER. So the Achieving the, G the Dream, or we call it simply the ATD grant, will support the development of OER degree pathways for Santa Ana College's Business Administration and Liberal Arts Associates degrees, which have the highest transfer rate at our institution. Oh, I'm sorry, my slides are like automatically forwarding. I had the same problem. Yeah, would you mind taking over for me, Carmen? Sure, do you need me to go backward or forward? Please go backward. I think it's one more, or no, you're fine where you're at. Thank okay. you. Okay, sure. And oh, actually, I'm ready for you to go to the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting behind. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about my role specifically as like OER librarian. I don't necessarily oversee the OER initiatives on our campus, as I mentioned earlier. So I'll go into some detail now about some of the more librarian type roles I play to support our OER um, campus initiatives. So first and foremost, the main support I provide for OER work is involves assisting faculty with identifying OER that aligns with their courses and student learning outcomes. Here I've shown an example of an SLO OER mapping system I use to share the results of my findings with faculty who request assistance with locating viable OER for their courses or who are involved with developing an OER course for one of our OER degree pathways that we're currently working on. The map itself lists SLOs for the course at hand, along with links relevant to OER. I've identified as a result of searching various OER repositories and evaluating OER recommended through OER professional listservs. Um, the map also notes the content type of the OER listed, for example, if it's a full course, a textbook, or some other form of learning or teaching tool. In cases of textbooks or full courses, I'll, I will also note the portions of that OER that seem to apply most specifically to the course learning outcome. The map also lists the license of the OER, which is especially important for our ATD grant that stipulates the sole use of CC licensed materials. Of course, I'm only providing a list of preliminary OER findings that in my mind seem relevant to the course, but ultimately the faculty member I'm assisting makes the final decision with their subject expertise. Next slide, please. Um, as with many other librarians involved with OER work, I've created an OER LibGuide with our faculty in mind to provide them OER resources, including links to OER repositories, as well as examples of OER for specific subject areas. The OER by subject portion of the guide was added to support a hands-on activity that was part of our OER summit this past October, and I'll be talking more about the summit shortly. I also felt it important to include the OER FAQ developed by our campus's OER faculty work group, which is a detailed document that um, includes important OER concepts and campus-specific OER curricular guidelines um, for matriculation and graduation and those sorts of things. 
The guide also contains OER best practices, scholarship, and professional development resources. I'm continually updating the guide as new resources become available, of course, and, and I'm definitely inspired by content and layout of other OER, OER guides I continue to come across. Starting to get tongue-tied with saying OER so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> the LibGuide is tied to our larger campus OER website, which if you want to check that out, it's simply sac for Santa Ana College edu slash OER. And the site highlights our campus's OER initiatives, recent news, student resources, and it includes one of the more popular features that demonstrates to our students how to find OER courses through SAC's course catalog. Um, this site also showcases sample OER courses taught at SAC as well and as well as a list of faculty involved with OER on our campus to help connect newer faculty coming in or who are becoming interested in doing OER themselves. Um, also on the OER or SAC OER site, um, you'll find some really great footage that was added from our recent OER summit, which includes video archives of the student and faculty panels that occurred at the event. Next slide, please. Um, so another aspect of my role as OER librarian has involved providing professional development workshops during previous flex weeks and new faculty orientations, um, along with our OER summit that I mentioned. During these workshops, I present on basic OER concepts, Creative Commons licensing, and attribution best practices. I also introduce available resources for locating OER. And I'm very happy to share out any of my presentation materials. So if you'd like a copy, just feel free to contact me. I included the program for the OER Summit we hosted at SAC this October, um, which was attended by over 100 faculty, librarians, and administrators from a variety of colleges and universities throughout the state. During the last part of the summit, I, along with some other members of our campus's OER faculty work group, provided hands-on workshops, allowing participants the opportunity to explore available OER for their courses and respective subject areas. So this was helpful for people who came to the summit that were kind of, they had heard about OER, but they maybe hadn't had a chance yet to explore some of the resources. And so we were just sort of directing them to some of the um, better repositories and peer reviewed um, resources so that they could just get an initial look at some of the OER content that might be relevant to their areas. And the next slide, please. So um, as stipulated by the ATD OER degree grant, we're working on uh, faculty developing OER courses as part of our OER degree pathways must submit a course map linking their course SLOs to all related assessments and instruction materials. So essentially they're mapping the entire course and these materials must all be Creative Commons licensed. So I'll be supporting the senior faculty member overseeing this, this course mapping portion of the grant and I will also be supporting faculty who are developing their courses for the grant much like I do um, any other faculty uh, interested in using OER um, by helping them search for OER options to replace their commercial based or otherwise non CC licensed course content. And then once the OER degree pathway courses have been fully developed, the goal is to have a model of the course that other faculty can use and adapt for their own purposes. I'll be involved with um, assisting in this process of creating te course templates uh, within our campus's LMS, or Learning Management System. Next slide, please. So one of the most rewarding parts of my work with OER at Santa Ana College is serving on our OER faculty work group. This committee is comprised of faculty across the discipline, um, 
disciplines involved with OER to varying degrees. I've shown one example of the many types of work we do as a committee. This is a screenshot of the extensive OER FAQ mentioned earlier that we developed for our campus. Um, we are also involved with making recommendations to our academic senate involving a variety of campus OER initiatives and best practices. And we do a variety of things to support the OER related projects that fall on the shoulders of our OER coordinator. And of course, a good deal of our efforts in the immediate future will involve supporting the development of our OER degree pathways. So that'll be our primary focus for now. Next slide, please. Um, it was mentioned in my brief description for um, this webinar that I would mention my uh, attendance at the 13th Annual Open Education Conference. So. Um, as I'm sure you have guessed, you can go on the conference website and not only view the program, but they've included some pretty extensive archiving of not only the presentation materials, but um, tweets, blogs, and other ways people have shared out about their conference experience through social media. So um, if you go to the conference archive link, as the arrow indicates here, um, you'll see a very extensive list of all the archives <laughs> that you can link to and, and read about, you know, different workshops, presentations, and people's um, responses to those. I went with um, the focus of attending or my focus in attending was on the librarian and open pedagogy tract workshops. One of the most um, inspiring workshops or presentations I saw was a uh, was a kind of like a gallery of of OER that faculty had developed with their students. So these were. Um, examples of OER from different institutions, different disciplines, um, different education levels where faculty had um, collaborated with their students to develop actual course materials that they're using in their future classes. And so this was um, really exciting for me to see because it's something I want to do with my library tech class that I teach here at SAC. Uh, it's, it, the class focuses on public services and libraries. And I felt like, you know, that class would be um, a good uh, audience to try this out with because many of the students actually work in libraries already um, while they're going through their certification program here. And they would have a lot of uh, really useful insights and experience to share along with um, supplemental instructional materials that talk about different aspects of public services. So um, I won't say too much more about the conference because you'll probably have your own um, areas of interest that you'll want to look at as you go through the program. You'll see there are many different OER related tracks. So you can link through the tracks and find those respective workshops and presentations, see the um, abstracts and presentation materials, which should be available all through the website. So at this time, I will turn it on to our, turn it over to our next presenter. And thanks, Carmen, for running the slides. Sure thing. All right, Dana, let's give this a shot. If it doesn't work, I can take over and drive for you. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Thanks, Carmen. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Ospina. I am the Open Content and Digital Publishing Librarian at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I want to make sure that we have some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to go through this um, fairly quickly, but you'll see that my last slide is all the inf my information. So please don't hesitate to contact me if anything I present seems to be of interest to you. I just celebrated my first year anniversary in this position, but prior to that, I spent two years as the Open Education Library Fellow here. And that position was one of the first fully dedicated OER positions um, 
for librarians. So it was a pretty exciting time to be starting in this field. And when I came on, I guess that was the end of 2013, almost immediately, <laughs> like Jan January of 2014, we started our Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative here. And I coordinated it alone for two years. And then in this past year, I have been co-coordinating it with our, uh, the university store representative. And that is, to my mind, a wonderful development. I'm really excited about it. He brings in a very different perspective and fresh energy. And so I think that we're going to be seeing some really exciting changes, um, or additions, I should say, not changes, but additions to our ALS program. So let me grab the... You know what? I'm not even getting. <laughs> I'm not even getting the thing to. No worries. <laughs> there you go. How Thank about you. that? Excellent. So our partners um, on campus. We don't have an official campus mandate or anything like that around affordability. So it is our, our program is grassroots in the sense that we draw on partnerships across the campus to run our ALS program, and so the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology, the Disability Resource Center library and the university store. And the way it works for us is we have two representatives from the library and one representative from each of the other organizations that this comprises our partners board essentially. And we come together to make all decisions about how we're going to use our funding. And these are the people that work with me. I'll talk a minute in a minute about our um, some of the workshops and things we do. These are the key players for us. And then from this core group, we expand out to work with other organizations on campus. Do you want to go to the next slide, please? So I put this up to show you, this is what we found we were dealing with. In 2014, our Student Library Advisory Council, this is a group of students who um, volunteer every year to be part of the library to give feedback and the student perspective to us, they run an annual survey. And in 2014, their survey asked a few questions about affordability. And this is what we found on our campus. And I think it was surprising to some people that this was the extent of either sharing or flat out not purchasing a book on our campus. So I use this statistic sometimes um, to make the case that affordability, even if it isn't you know, being spoken about very publicly is a real issue on our campus and students are concerned about the cost of textbooks. And so I just wanted to throw that up there. It was the questions that the students asked were very useful in helping us to frame our initiative and also helpful as talking points. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? So one of the one of the things we do, one of the ways we try to reach faculty is through workshops and we offer two to three per year, depending. And as I mentioned earlier, it's collaboration among all of those campus partners. And we modestly incentivize these. And I stress modestly. Like Aileen said, you, you can't be in this for the money because we simply don't have enough money to compensate faculty fully for their time. So we are hoping that by showing them at least a good faith effort that we're giving them what we can, we are able to bring faculty in and, and to help support the time that they're at least spending in our workshop. And our workshops, we usually have an introduction to OER as one of our um, workshops. And then we do, in the winter quarter, oftentimes, a workshop on uh, teaching with e-resources. And I'm going to talk in a moment about, you'll see why this is very important for us to offer our faculty. But it's a workshop about e-pedagogy and e-readers and how to make the most of digital reading <laughs> environments to help students. I think it's very important when we are supporting and promoting ebooks to support faculty as students will be adopting these resources. We also often offer in the spring a workshop on fair use and copyright and using open resources from the web and the best practices for that. And that's been a fairly popular, um, a fairly popular workshop. So I think we're going to be offering that again this spring. And our attendance really varies. We have had workshops where there were 30 participants and workshops where there were five. And so we just never know. We send an email out to all faculty. I use my, uh, the, the library liaisons to the different colleges on campus to send out emails to solicit faculty. And our Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology also sends out to faculty. So that's how we try to blanket the campus and let people know about um, the workshops. Okay, next slide. 
students have been an area that I've really been focusing on as of late. I feel like, again, I agree <clears throat> that without faculty buy-in, there isn't much we can do. But I've been trying to find ways to engage students in this because I think the student voice on our campus is very important. Faculty listen to students as do, do the administration. And so I feel like we really need to provide an opportunity for our students to learn about what we can provide them on campus. And so one of the ways we do that is we, our budget for ALS supports an ALS student advocate. She comes out of um, our equal opportunity program. And so she is very familiar with the plight of students who are economically challenged. And she also has a great network for providing information to these students about what resources may be available to them. She also helps me with many different things that we do, whether it's um, supporting a new marketing campaign, provide, you know, developing collateral for that, or even when we're setting up and getting catering ready. She's, she's my assistant for all things ALS, and she's been terrific. This is her last year. I'm going to be very sorry to see her go, but we will bring in a new ALS student advocate. One of the newest and most exciting things, and this was student driven, I'm supporting them and I'm the faculty advisor for this, but I <clears throat> did not set this up, is an emerging student textbook affordability group. They had their first meeting in November and they put together a wonderful marketing campaign and all sorts of things, a, a digital marketing campaign, I should say, that went out on social media and we had 12 students attend. I purchased pizza for all of them, and they really were able to have an incredible discussion about, oh, sorry about that, about affordability and ways that they could get involved. And one of the ways I'll just mention briefly is using the ASI on campus, going to ASI meetings and starting to talk about this, because ASI has a direct link to the administration and to the Academic Senate, and so there are ways in which ASI can be a very powerful voice for students and for moving affordability forward. The third thing I'm going to talk about is something called textbook match. And Carmen, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, we, mo we moved through my slide, my initial slide quickly, but I think maybe you noticed that in parentheses I had an A. So it's O-A-E-R. And the reason I did that is because the A stands for affordability. We do have some very powerful programs around OER going on. For instance, our whole introductory chemistry series is now using OpenStax, and that was a major adoption. So there are definitely faculty who have found open resources that work for them. But what I realized is if we really wanted to have an impact on affordability for students and save students money, one of the ways, a low-hanging fruit for us, was to implement a textbook match program. And what that program does is it gets the adoption data every quarter. Um, we now get it through centralized IT, but it initially came through the bookstore. And we compare that data to our library holdings, our e-resources, and we find matches. And if Carmen, if you want to click on the link or however you want to do this, we, we can see what works or go to my first tab. Let's just do that. Okay, whatever is going to work here. So it's, yeah, this one over on the left. There we go. Great. And you want to scroll down a little bit for me, please? Mm -hmm. So what this is, we're, we're right now updating the UI, so it's going to look different. But what this is, we provide students with a list of, you want to scroll a little further. For instance, this is fall quarter. So you can see we list the course number, the professor, and then we have a link to the book and whether or not it's DRM free. And we are really, our DRM free um, inclusions are increasing, which is terrific news, because that's essentially, we're providing a free, the library is providing a free textbook for the students. And I realize that this does not, it does not sort of fit into the ethos of open. And as we would absolutely like to move more and more faculty towards open, we see this as a way to immediately reduce costs for students when we can. It's been quite successful. I think our statistics now are we've been doing it for nine quarters and we've touched enrollment of 16,000 students and um, over 16,000 students and over 400 courses. So I'm very proud of what we've been able to do here. And it really, for us, we have a library programmer. And so he wrote the script for this and it, it was not an incredibly onerous uh, program to start. And I think the savings, if you think of even $100 per textbook, that could be a potential of you know, over $1.6 million. So it's, I, I feel like it's really been helpful for our campus. 
and it's something that students can go to without the faculty. We, of course, encourage the faculty to, um, to show this to the students, to publicize that this exists, but we're also publicizing. We ran a pretty extensive marketing campaign. We put um, textbook match the link to it on coffee sleeves across campus. We've done some interesting things to try to get the word out for this. So that's um, textbook match. And if you want to go to my next slide, Carmen. Dana, Actually, just a quick question before we move sure. on. You said you have a programmer there in the library and that the, um, that they put together the code for this and it wasn't yes. Too difficult. Do you know if, if they have shared that code they or have it available on GitHub? He has, and also he has iterated on it. So I want to check with him to see if the latest version is up there. Okay. But he did make the code available. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. And so the next slide, we probably, these are just um, the resources. So if you want to go back to the links, I'll just quickly show the links. Just some of the web resources we have, um, as you've seen with um, Aileen and Annie, it's similar thing. This is our open and affordable resources at Kennedy Library web page. And from this page, Carmen has already opened the other tabs. We can go and look at, for instance, this is my um, guide for open and affordable resources, and I link to some that do discipline-specific resources, as well as, uh, you want to go up a little bit, Carmen? Mm -hmm. uh, perfect. As well as electronic resources, Creative Commons and Open Access, our Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative, our student ALS Advocate makes a student page, and then I have it in the news page for different um, updates to what's going on um, nationally around uh, open and affordable resources. And finally, if you want to click on the faculty showcase, this is something that's um, in development. We, you can scroll down, though, and see we have had faculty members who were interested in contributing their experience using transitioning to an open or affordable resource. And this is really faculty to faculty. If you want to click on, like, um, Jean Lee's, for instance. So... Jean is asked questions about, we, this, we have a form that we send out to the faculty members and they fill it out. And she then, if you want to just scroll through Carmen, we can just see. It's very much about helping other faculty, both on our campus and throughout the country, if they're thinking about motive or having um, an interest in making this transition and what were some of the challenges and benefits to that. So those are sort of my web resources. And if you want to go back to the slideshow, I just have one final slide and then we can get to everybody's questions. What we're doing as far as next steps go. Um, as I mentioned, I now have a co-coordinator and the bookstore uses different marketing techniques. And so I was thinking that maybe we could look at their marketing models to see if there were ways that we could further increase awareness and adoption on campus. So I'll be working with uh, Reza, my co-coordinator, to think about ways that we can implement some of the university store's marketing models. We have more emphasis on um, ADA compliance. Uh, we, our Disability Resource Center is so accessible and available to help faculty. We want to make that a more integrated part of using open and affordable resources. So we're working on ways to streamline that process. As I mentioned, we're updating the textbook match UI. That is another thing that we're doing. And we're also going to be looking into how we can ensure that faculty members aren't unknowingly putting um, content in course readers that we already subscribe to through the library because we don't want students to have to essentially pay twice. So if we have that material, it's already available to students. That's some of something that we're going to be looking into um, to do. Additionally, we're trying to get better statistics on how many faculty members are using OER. As was mentioned before, it's very hard to know. I know the faculty I work with, but what about all the other faculty out there? So one of the things I'm thinking about is if the bookstore, when they send out their adoption form, if they could have a, a choice, a field for OE, using OER, then we could filter by those that are using OER and I could contact those faculty members directly. So we're seeing if that's possible as a way to, um, to get better statistics and understand exactly how much money we're saving. Uh, last slide, I guess, is my information. So there you have it. And please, again, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm happy to talk to you about our program and, you know, any, all, all of the successes and challenges we've encountered. So thank you. So I think we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions now. If you could go ahead and type your question into the chat box, that might just make it easier because we do have about 25 folks here. Um, 
Or I guess you could always unmute yourself and ask the question. We've got a little over five minutes. And thank you to our presenters. I really appreciate all of the hard work that you put into this. Dana, what does ASI stand for? Oh, Associate Student Association of Students Incorporated. Is that right? Somebody can correct me. No, okay. That's right. We have one on our campus at East Bay as well. Yep. I think it might be a Cal State thing. Oh, maybe. it's just a Cal State thing. Okay. It's a student association, though, so maybe something similar with a different acronym exists someplace else. Yeah, we we have one, we have a representative on our Senate uh, subcommittee, mm -hmm. and so I'm I, I agree with you though. I need to spend more time going out with them. <laughs> so Charlotte has asked about the the grants. There are several grants noted, and uh, are those available to everyone or just California public schools? Now I know that AB seven ninety eight is only available to uh, I think it was the CSUs and the community colleges. That's right. But there are other granting organizations out there. I know folks have gotten grants from the Hewlett Foundation. Um, I think if you dig around, you might be able to find grants for uh, private institutions. And I've had conversations with, with folks at uh, some of the smaller private schools about using this as a way to develop a, a program with your uh, development office or your office of advancement to approach private donors to see if they would be interested in establishing a fund for uh, OERs. Anyone else know of any grant opportunities that might be open to outside of public schools? No, I, I, this is Aline speaking. <clears throat> I don't actually, but I know I've had quite a number of conversations with our university advancement representative for the library. And th the challenge is making sure you have something tangible that you can put their name on. Uh, we haven't been very successful in getting money that way at so far but uh, you know there's always tomorrow but um if you've got a university advancement or some kind of fundraising committee uh, you can talk to your dean he probably has a he or she probably has a liaison to that group and maybe you can have a conversation with them about it any other questions here in the last few minutes So I'm going to go ahead and make the recording available and I'll also make the slides available and we'll share them out. And if there are questions that come up later on, you can either send them to the score listserv, you can send them to me, or you can send them directly to the presenters. Thanks to everyone for spending some time this morning with us talking about OER and affordable learning materials. So I think that I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.